Welcome, everybody. Thank you yeah, so like much whistles. for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the first Parsons Healthy Materials Lab Symposium. We are delighted that you're all here. Yeah. And we know from the RSVPs that people are here from all across the nation and from around the world, and we're grateful for traveling here. We're also very excited for the next 24 hours. So um, I'm John Sara Ruth. I'm the design director at Healthy Materials Lab. And I'm Alison Mears. I'm the director of Healthy Materials Lab. Yay. <laughs> Dynamic duo here. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the lab. John Sara is then going to talk a little bit about the keynote speaker. So in case you don't know, Healthy Materials Lab is an interdisciplinary, design-led research lab at Parsons, the new school. We strive to put human and ecological health at the center of every design decision. We raise awareness about the toxic materials in our built environment and develop strategies to enable architects and designers to change their design practices to make healthier places for all people. We know that the majority of people in our communities face the repercussions of these problems daily. We see the frightening rise in cancer rates, decreasing fertility issues, and raising, uh, raising, rising asthma rates. We work with organizations to increase their capacity to support local communities to confront these issues. The field of material health includes many perspectives, topics, issues, and innovators. We want to convene all of you to discuss all aspects of this field together. We're grateful to have so many experts from a wide variety of backgrounds and disciplines from all parts of the US and across the world together in one room. And we appreciate that so many people have made time in their busy schedules to, to be here today and hopefully tomorrow as well. Um, we throw out a challenge to you here, tonight and tomorrow, to radically rethink the way you design, to continue to effectively collaborate and work together to bring about change. How we move forward is not clear. Tonight and tomorrow, we look to all of you for clues to new collaborative approaches and design practices. <laughs> so like Allison says, and we talk about this a lot, we are living in a time of radical change. It's a new era. Almost every day we hear about the climate crisis and about people, animals, lands, and waters suffering from extraordinary disasters linked to changes in our ecologies. Where we live, where we find sustenance, to where we travel are all under threat of catastrophic change. And that threat brings an underlying sense of uncertainty and a charge to rethink how we do everything. We think we're in need of a reorientation so that we can better understand a way forward. While planning for this symposium, Allison and I, with our amazing, amazing team at Healthy Materials Lab, began digging for a voice who could help inspire that reorientation. We were honored and incredibly grateful when Winona LaDuke said yes and accepted our invitation to give the opening keynote address tonight. For many of you, Winona does not need introduction. She's a spokesperson for so many of the core issues of the new school. She's an activist for social and environmental justice, a climate activist, a political activist, a two-time vice presidential candidate with Ralph Nader for the Green Party. She's a voice for the water protectors at Standing Rock, for the next economy, and a voice for our future. Winona LeDuc comes to us tonight from her home and workplace, the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. For nearly 40 years, she's been an activist with the Ojibwe Nation, where she works for indigenous rights, human rights, green and rural economies, grassroots organizing, local foods, alternative sources of energy, and the immense value of clean water. Winona was trained as an economist at Harvard University and earned a master's degree in community and economic development at Antioch University. She's currently the executive director of the group Honor the Earth, a nonprofit organization 
founded to raise awareness and financial support for indigenous environmental justice. Most recently, she's been growing industrial hemp to bring textile production back to the United States. And, like us, she's a big advocate for hempcrete, the building material of the past and for the future. She's a writer, a spokesperson, and an inspired champion for equity, reducing carbon, for new economies, for clean air, clean water, and clean food, and for entirely regenerative ecosystems. And as she says, indigenous people have a lot of experience with sustainability. Enormous thanks to you, Winona, for making time to come here tonight to ignite the fire for our symposium and to make healthier futures for everybody. Please join me in welcoming Winona Leduc. Yes, no, thank you guys for having me. Hi there. I need I need Nindaway Maganaduk, Nikagwegitamagas, Binesi Kwe and Dijinakaz, Makwando Dam, Gababani Kagish Kanaginang and Dunjabamigwich. Telling you where I'm from, which is a White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. Y'all know where Minnesota is? Between Bemidji and Fargo, that mean anything? kind of way up northwest, but um, Bear Clan, and um, I'm really honored to be here with you tonight. I was honored when I got asked, and because um, I'm interested, like I, I know about a lot of things, but you all know about a lot of other things, and together that's how we're gonna make change. You know, that's how things happen. There's a, a great uh, political leader of our of, uh, Lakota people a long time ago, and his name was Sitting Bull. And he used to, he had a, one thing, many things he said that was great. He said, uh, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. That's this moment. That's us. That's the ones that got an opportunity, a great spiritual opportunity to figure out how to keep the world from genetically engineering this food supply, just, you know, protect our rivers and our waters, and uh, keep ourselves from combusting to oblivion. That's us. We got this shot, so let's do it. So these are some pictures on a little bit of my story. Um, this is a water protector. Um, that's what I am, I'm a water protector. I, uh, this is a painting of an indigenous woman. If you can tell that, I guess. It's in, it's in downtown Duluth, Minnesota. But I say it um, because uh, in our area and a lot of areas, Native women are not treated well, and a lot of us are missing and are murdered. We have a really high rate of violence against us. But this woman is is not uh, missing, and she's quite obvious. She's about 20, 20 feet wide and about 30 feet tall. And she's on 2nd Street and 2nd Avenue in downtown Duluth. And this is, uh, you know, she is a water protector. This is where I live, Gawawie Gamug, Gawawie Gamug. And, um, you know, this month in our language is called Gosh no Gizis, which means a freezing over moon. Manadu Gizis soons, Gucci Manadu Gizis, little spirit moon, the great spirit moon. We have a moon then, it's called uh, Nemei Benegizis, the sucker moon, Ona Banegizis. That's around March, they call that the hard crusted snow moon, or sometimes we call it the moon you don't want to do a face plant in the snow. <laughs> Maple syrupy moon, Wabaganegizis, then the flower moon, Ode Benegizis, strawberries. Mean Gizis, blueberry moon, Manomenike Gizis, our wild rice making moon. Then we have a. Uh, Benakwe o Gizis, when the leaves fall. I thought you might like to hear some of the language. That's the same language that's from this area. You know, our people are the Lenape people, too. We came from here a long time ago. That's a language that's from this land. But I thought, did you also notice that, that those moons, our Ojibwe calendar, did you notice that none of those moons was named after a Roman emperor? I just like to say that because I want to point out it's possible to have an entire worldview that has nothing to do with empire. You'll be okay. I know this is the empire state, but not needed anymore. Time to maybe just like chill out a little bit. And I think that's what we're all talking about at this point. So, um, you know, that is a little bit of this story. This is some art from my area. I always like to show this art because as you heard from my resume, I was an undergraduate at Harvard. And if you wanted to study the art from Europe, you went to the fine arts department. But if you wanted to study indigenous art, you went to anthropology. Uh, so what I want to point out is kind of like a valuation of knowledge. 
And what I'm going to suggest humbly is that uh, perhaps the solution to the problems we face may not be found in the same paradigm which created them. So we might want to think about like this moment in time, being courageous enough to get out of the boxes that we put ourselves in and think, how are we going to work together to make things better? How are we going to clean up messes that have already been made? And how are we going to make something beautiful for the future? And that's a great spiritual opportunity to be those people. But to be those people, we got to be not only coherent, coherent, that's how John Trudeau would say it, but we also got to call on our highest selves to do the best. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about where I'm from. This is where I'm from, where the wild rice is. I'm from, I, you know, someone asked me, I, I refer to this place where I live as the, where the wild things are. You know, and on a worldwide scale, indigenous people are about 4% of the world's population with about 75% of the world's biodiversity. You know, that's us. We're the ones who live where the wild things are. And we just want to keep it that way. You know, which is kind of what we need to do if we're going to take care of our Mother Earth. You got to like just leave some things the way the Creator intended for them to be. You got to leave the wild things where they're supposed to be. This is wild rice, Manoman, our most sacred food. You know, in our, in, we are instructed to go to this place from the East Coast. We are instructed, we followed a shell which appeared in the sky to the place where the food grows upon the water. Those are some serious instructions. And that took us here to this wild rice. It's the only place in the world it grows is our sacred monoman. And that's what a sustainable economy looks like. You harvest on that lake as we have. This is the Thompsons. This is um, Todd and his father. And uh, they har our people harvested on that same lake for about 8,000 years. Two sticks in a canoe, you know, wild rice, monoman. So I point that out because that's what a sustainable economy looks like. And that's where we live. Where I live, there's like bears and wolves and, and badgers and porcupines and beavers and otters and uh, butterflies and frogs. I live where the wild things are, sturgeon. That's a magical place, and that's the story of this place. So, you know, I just want to, I was asked to kind of give a little bit of a thinking about this. So, I call this the, this is what I call making America great again. <laughs> 8,000 varieties of corn. That's when America was great. Tremendous agrobiodiversity. In the Western Hemisphere, that is where corn came from. You know, so I just want to point out that we weren't just like slacking over here until somebody came over. These corn varieties were developed by indigenous people. And you know, we're all wonderfully clever, particularly if we're at this conference. But some days I'm like, you know, I don't know about humans. I'm sure some of you have the same feelings some days. Like we certainly do botch things up, right? That's what we do. But you know, when I look at corn, then I'm like, oh, but there's corn. We did a good thing there. And I just point that out because corn doesn't exist in nature. It's teosinte, teosinte, and then it's adapted and these 8,000 varieties are made by love between, you know, this the person caring for their corn to make these more beautiful things. And the people who did that was indigenous women. That's who did most of that agrobiodiversity creating those varieties because we're the ones who harvest, we're the ones who cook it, and we're the ones who store it. So you want to know who should be in charge of saving seeds? That's us, right? But I point that out because this is the land of people in white lab coats. And I want to point out that none of those varieties was developed by Monsanto or Syngenta, right? And so that's when America was great. America was great when there was tremendous agrobiodiversity. America was great when there was tremendous biodiversity. Single largest migratory herd in the world was the buffalo herd. 50 million buffalo. You know, that's when America was great. America was great when passenger pigeons darkened the skies and when you could drink the water from every river and creek and the sturgeon were in every northern lake. That's when America was great. So it's really important that we remember that. Remember that. Don't change that narrative. And then also, you know, a lot of Americans suffer from what, you know, I think it's historic amnesia. It has a lot to do with transience has a lot to do with America's culture. But you know, you don't want to have historic amnesia and you don't want to have ecological amnesia. Though you forget that those beautiful things were there. We want to remember and we want to do our part to protect them or to bring them back. 
that's what we've done in our community. We've done a lot of work to bring back those things or to just make sure they're good. But you know, it is this juxtaposition because in the same area where there was once 50 million buffalo, there are today 28 million cattle. And those cattle require an entire fossil fuels economy to support them. And so what I want to point out is in a time of climate change, in a time of ecological challenges, you might want to think of what animals are where. You know, because those buffalo lived on prairie grass, and the prairie grass, you know, go about eight feet tall and eight feet under, you know. Biodiversity is about life. And so as we think of what we're, where we are and, and uh, what we're going to do, you know, remember that difference, the 28 million and the 50 million. You know, you might want to hang with something that knows how to hang out in a pre-petroleum and a post-petroleum era, because that's where we need to be. So, you know, that is our story, and then this is the story that we are living in. You know, this conflict between these two worldviews, I refer to this as Windigo economics. Windigo economics, as you heard, I had spent a lot of time in economics at Harvard. But, you know, as I look at the world, you know, there's different ways to put this, but there's an indigenous economy or a land-based economy which reaffirms relationship to place is based on cyclical understanding, is based on a reciprocity and a gratitude that you take only what you need and you leave the rest. And that if you are gonna ensure that you can harvest in the years ahead, you will care well for your soil. You will care well for that which is there. And then there is a different economy which is based on taking without respect, is based on aggrandizing wealth and continuing to build and amass more and having no regard for the land or the people who live there. And that's kind of this American economy that we have. It's an aberration of an e economic system because it is not in any way about well-being, it's about greed. And so I was asked to talk a little bit about my history. You know, I'm 60 years old and I've spent, I will tell you, most of my life fighting bad ideas. You know, there's a lot of bad ideas out there and pretty much you can open the paper any day and there's some other really absurd idea that someone has come up with, right? I mean, not just Trump, you know what I'm saying? Not just Trump, but across the board, some crazy idea someone got. You know, but those people, you know, maybe because they're privileged white males, I'm not sure, get their ideas funded, <laughs> right? And then pretty soon you're dealing with a, an idea that was a bad idea that now has money. Right? And I know a lot of you are familiar with this scenario, but I've spent a lot of my life dealing with that. And in the past seven years, I've been fighting pipelines, pipelines. And I know here in New York, you've been fighting pipelines too. And so what I'm going to say is something that a lot of you know because of who you are, but America has a D in infrastructure. We have a D in infrastructure. Like y'all, I signed up for first world country. Did y'all sign up for first world country? How did we end up with the D in infrastructure, right? But that infrastructure is like the crumbling oil and fossil fuels infrastructure and refineries in this country that were built 50 to 70 years ago at the beginning of the fossil fuel era. And now we're at the end of the fossil fuel era and that stuff is kind of like crumbling. And instead of dealing with the transition to the next economy, which I'm kind of interested in, I'm kind of a fan of the idea of a graceful transition into the next economy. Y'all follow me on this? What they're doing is instead of that, is they're trying to like double up on their fossil fuels infrastructure, right? And what we want is, is a way out. We want a way out of this system. Everybody in this room knows that you need a way out of that. And so, and what we want is infrastructure for people and the planet, not for oil companies. You know, that's the basics of it. You know, so for, for seven years, I've been fighting pipelines that come in my area. And those pipelines were proposed by a corporation called Enbridge third largest corporation in Canada. Just bought Spectre, they're out here. Um, you know, they're, they're pretty much in, 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 the, in the middle of the pipeline. They're the largest pipeline company in North America. And what they wanted to do is put a 640,000 barrel a day pipeline across that wild rice lake that you saw those guys on. And we, we didn't know much about pipelines. We don't have any oil. And we didn't really know much about this. And then all of a sudden we said, no, that's a really bad idea. And so we fought them. We fought and we built a multiracial alliance in Minnesota of water protectors, of, uh, you know, of people who lived on lakeshore homes, of uh, people who you know, just didn't want oil in a, in a place where there's 10,000 lakes, right? 
And we fought and we built this multiracial alliance to fight this project called the Sandpiper. And uh, after uh, three years of fighting them, being in every regulatory hearing, having uh, prayers and ceremonies with our, with our bodies and our horses, and uh, doing pretty much everything you can in civil society to make things right. You know, uh, the Friends of the Headwaters, a group from, of citizens down the, down the road from my house, they filed a lawsuit requiring an environmental impact statement. You know these terms, right? Environmental impact statement on this proposed pipeline, telling the state they should require one. You know, and I'm probably with you, like, I feel like I'd like the system to work. You know, I feel like you shouldn't have to file a lawsuit to make your state do an environmental impact statement on a 640,000 barrel per day pipeline. It seems like common sense. You should check something like that out, <laughs> right? But we filed, and when, we, when they filed, it was very short thereafter that the Enbridge announced the cancellation of this pipeline, the Sandpiper. So what I'm telling you is, is that it is possible, as you know in New York, to stop a pipeline project. It takes a lot, of, a lot of energy, a lot of heart and soul. The problem is that we didn't stop Enbridge nor their greed because they went to North Dakota and they purchased 28% of a pipeline known as the Dakota Access Pipeline. And that pipeline was financed largely by Enbridge because it was not doing so good at the time. And that was another fracked oil pipeline that was intended to run uh, from the fracked oil fields of North Dakota down towards Texas. And initially that proposal for that pipeline was to put that pipeline just north of the city of Bismarck, you know, uh, the capital of North Dakota. And it turned out that that city was 95% white. And they didn't feel that an intake, that, that, that there should be a pipeline near the intake valve for the water out of the Missouri River that was going to the city of Bismarck, North Dakota. They felt that instead that pipeline should go just north of the water intake valve of the Standing Rock Lakota Nation. And that that's what we should do with large energy infrastructure. <laughs> and so uh, they moved that pipeline and they started to build. And, and a lot of you know, because this is in 2016, just after Enbridge canceled ours, by September they had fully moved into North Dakota. And this is some of the pictures of civil society in North Dakota. And a lot of you probably saw some of this, and, and some of you were probably there. But the point is, is that at a certain point in your addiction, you need to deal with what you're doing. And so that's kind of my point here, because I am a fossil fuel addict. We're all addicts. We live in this society that is entirely jacked up on fossil fuels, and we're, we've grown pretty entitled to it. And so as a consequence of that, we have become to act we've begun to act a little bit like addicts. And, you know, I say that, and I don't know if any of you have addicts in your family, but I find that, you know, they kind of lie about stuff, and then it's usually always your fault, and then they, you know, rationalize some kind of thing, and my point is, is that that's what we've begun to do. And what that looks like in a fossil fuel addiction is that you do all kinds of crazy things to make your fix, and so you do crazy things like, it's called extreme extraction, the bottom of the barrel or the top of the mountain. You blow off the top of 500 mountains in Appalachia to sell that coal to somebody in India, because you ain't even burning it in the US anymore, but that's like late stage capitalism at its best. Or maybe you do something like you just drill 20,000 feet under the ocean and hope that's gonna work out for you until you do something, have some problem like the deep water horizon. Or maybe Taylor oil, which continues to just seep into the Gulf. Or else you do something like the tar sands you know, which is taking something that's like the equivalent of sludge and trying to figure out how to shove it down a pipe so you can get it here. Or maybe you do something like fracking, right? Which is blow up the bedrock of Mother Earth, 502 chemicals, and you don't have to report them because there's this assumption that what goes down will not come up. That's always a good thought, huh? So everybody in this room knows that none of those are good ideas, but when you get into extreme behavior, you do crazy stuff to make your fix. And so my point is, is that now will be the time to start moving on before we just have entire catastrophe in that. You know, and people say it's really hard to move away from fossil fuels or you know, the fossil fuel era, and I'm like, you know what? We didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of rocks, <laughs> right? You know, we just like move on out, got some new ideas. No time for the Renaissance like now. Because my point is that this is what happens to civil society when corporations 
the rights of corporations supersede the rights of individuals. And when water protectors are demonized and put under $38 million of military repression, that's Standing Rock, a Selma moment for all of us who were there. I particularly like this photo of, this is some of my, I call these guys my nephews, I ride horse with them, but you know, when you're facing a large squad of riot police, you should just stand on your horse, you know? But there's a lot that we learned out of that, and um, you know, I hope we all learned something out of that. I know that AOC was inspired by Standing Rock, and a lot of people were inspired by that moment where we saw who we were. We saw who we were, and we saw that we were not afraid, and we saw that we have way more vision than they have and that what we need to do is to keep strong and to move ahead. And what I want to tell you is that today in North Dakota, the largest scale utility solar project in all of North Dakota is right there in Canning Ball in the Standing Rock Reservation. They're going from, they have 300 kilowatts now, but they're about to go to three megawatts. That's cool, right? That's cool. You know, it's still the deep north, though, let me tell you. Every place else but Standing Rock is a deep north. And this is what it looks like there. So my point is, is that this is actually a billboard out in North Dakota that wasn't taken out by Native people. This is taken out by non-Native people because when you get into this complicated and complex set of basically your addiction, you do bad stuff. And this is what it looks like. And then this is what it looks like on my reservation. This is the proposed line three. We defeated the, em the Enbridge Sandpiper, 640,000 barrel a day, and now we are facing line three, the single largest tar sands pipeline. 915,000 barrels a day of oil that they want to send barreling through. And you know what the thing is, is that if they get it through Minnesota, that's the only place they do not have the permission to go ahead. That's because of seven years of battling on that one. But if they, you know, what we are stopping is all that oil that would go to the Straits of Mackinac and that precarious little under the bridge gig. All that oil that would go through Kalamazoo, that's the oil we're stopping. And pretty much you don't want any more tar sands oil out there. It's the dirtiest oil in the world, 82 bucks a barrel and no pipeline. And this is kind of the last of the bummer part of my speech, but this is what I deal with, right? So just to say, five years ago, there was five tar sands pipelines, because Alberta is trying as hard as it can to get its landlocked oil at 82 bucks a barrel, as compared to 43 bucks a barrel down in the Permian Basin. Just to give you a sense, so it's the dirtiest oil in the world, and it's the most expensive oil in the world. And Canada just needs a way out, and they don't have one. That's what we're dealing with here. And so what you got is these five pipeline proposals that were here two years ago, five years ago, the first one would be is called Energy East. That's a long dotted line. That never received approval by the National Energy Board. The purple one is called the Northern Gateway. That was an, Ener that was an Enbridge proposal. That never received permission by the National Energy Board. That other one was TransCanada. This blue one here is called the Kinder Morgan Pipeline, Trans, um, Trans Mountain Pipeline. It is now known as uh, Trudeau West because that pipeline uh, receiving no, no support by the province of British Columbia, embroiled in litigation. Um, the company, Kinder Morgan, a Texas company, said, you know, we don't really know if we want to do this after Standing Rock. They saw what had happened there. So we don't really know if we want to do this, Canada. We might just bail. And so Canada, Premier Trudeau, that, that guy up north, he bought that pipeline. He bought that pipeline for about $4.8 billion. That company made a really good bunch of money on it. And then what happened is, is that the day after Premier Trudeau purchased this pipeline in a desperate effort to get his tar sands oil to market, the day after that, the Canadian uh, Court of Appeals, Federal Court of Appeals in British Columbia ruled that all permits were null and void on that pipeline because they did not have the consent of the First Nations. So what do you do with a $4.8 billion pipeline without any permits, right? <laughs> you try to figure out how to sell it to somebody. And so he's in a little bit of a scramble up there doing a lot of really nefarious stuff, trying to sell that pipeline. Two pipelines left, basically. The purple and yellow one is Keystone, the embattled Keystone that had the 383,000-gallon leak about three weeks ago. Brand new pipe, almost 10 years old. They're trying to make that one bigger, and they're trying to complete some of this second run that would go through... Um, this purple run. And then the green is, is the pipeline that we are facing, line three. So I'm telling you this because 
the reason that I'm here talking to you about hemp is because of all this. Because I want to answer to the problems that we are facing. Now, this is who I work for. This is my community. This is what it looks like in Duluth right now. This is what it looks like, you know, in the North Country. And so, as a water protector, you know, as, as a, a woman who lives in the North, if we are not successful in stopping this pipeline in the regulatory process and in the, in the divestment movement, it's a battle between their tenacity and ours. You know, and the reason I know that is because the Koch brothers were the largest owners of tar sands assets until about two months ago. And then the Koch brothers sold all their tar sands assets. And nobody would buy them but a Canadian corporation. And so what I'm saying is it's kind of the end of the deal. It's the end of the gig when the, when the Koch brothers sell it. Y'all follow me on this? And then a week after they sold all of that tar sand stuff at a tremendous loss, David Koch took a ride and, and you know, passed on. Rest in peace. Remember that? My little theory was he might have choked on greed. <laughs> anyway, rest in peace, buddy. So having said that, you know, what I'm saying is, is that if we can't stop them and, and they keep pushing ahead, they're pushing hard on us now. They are full of hate and fear in the North. If they are able to somehow get through all of, the, all of Minnesota and begin to construct that pipeline, we will be there by the tens of thousands. And we ask you to come join us. And you know what? If you miss Standing Rock, you're going to want to come to Minnesota. And the other thing is, is that Minnesota is very good for camping in the summer. 2020 camp in Minnesota. Just put that on your date book, okay? <laughs> anyway, so I'm here because I want a way out of this conundrum. In our prophecies as Anishinaabe people, long time ago, we were told that we, we would, we, we would uh, come to a point in our lives as Anishinaabe people where we would be faced with a path with two, a fork in it. There'd be two paths ahead. And they call this the time of the seventh fire. And in the time of the seventh fire, which is the time that we are in now, we are told that we would have a choice between two paths. And one path, they said, would be well-worn, but it would be scorched. And the other path would not be well-worn, and it would be green. And it would be our choice upon which path to embark. So I'm pretty sure that that's not just for us. I'm pretty sure that this moment in time is this moment where we must take the initiative and have the courage to make that which is beautiful, to make that green path which is beautiful, which is about life, and which is about our future generations, whether they have wings or fins or roots or paws. So that is this moment and this is this project. So I have been a hemp farmer for four years. I spend much of my time, as you heard, fighting dysfunctional ideas. <laughs> but, you know, I am also a farmer. And for many years, I have grown uh, traditional varieties of corn, beans, squash, potatoes, and tobacco. I'm a heritage farmer. And uh, about four years ago, I decided that I wanted to grow hemp. And so my interest is in fiber hemp. And I have a state of Minnesota permit for fiber hemp. And the reason I wanted to grow hemp is largely because of the material economy facets of this a magical plant. There was a Kentucky farmer in the film Misunderstood by Patagonia. And the Kentucky farmer, I can't remember the brother's name, but he said, at a certain point in time, we had a choice between a hydrocarbon economy and a carbohydrate economy. We had a choice between a hydrocarbon economy and a carbohydrate economy. And we took the wrong choice. And so what I want to do is to talk about how we are going to build a post-petroleum economy. And that has to be built with something like hemp. And in saying that, you know, every facet of that which is the hydrocarbon economy is particularly problematic. There's really no escape from it. And so I am particularly interested in fiber hemp for textiles. That's my interest. And that's largely because most of what we wear today is either cotton or fossil fuels. 
and an average t-shirt and jeans takes 5,000 gallons of water. On a worldwide scale, cotton represents 4% of the world's agricultural crops and 24% of the world's agricultural chemicals. That's a lot of fossil fuels that should not be put on land or in our water. Then you look at the options. Like most people in this room, like myself, I'm like half dressed in polyester, right? Where did all that stuff come from? Every one of those came from fossil fuels. Every one of them is toxic in its production method and every one of them is toxic in its disintegration method. That's where you get the microfibers that show up in all of our water. And so what it is incumbent upon us to do is to move towards natural textiles. Now it turns out that hemp is one of the best facets of opportunities for this. And so this is a little bit about fiber. The uh, bast fiber is what I'm interested in. Um, the inside, the, the herd, is what they do um, most of the hempcrete with. But it is a plant that they say there are 50,000 uses for it. But at its most simple, let us just say this. The word canvas comes from cannabis. And so that has a pretty profound set of opportunities in the materials economy. And that's my interest. Of course, every rope, every sail, it, it was all hemp. It was all hemp. And so the state of Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills in it. We grew our clothes, we manufactured our own rope, and we um, you know, had an entire hemp economy. That was until the end of World War II, passage of the Marijuana Prohibition Act, when hemp was made illegal in this country. And so this country has suppressed hemp for that many years, or 70 years, and in that suppression, other countries have moved ahead but we have no hemp industry in this country. And when I began growing four years ago, I, I grant, grow, began growing specifically for the intention of fiber hemp. With the passage of the farm bill this last year or this year, there is an entire, you know, growing everywhere on hemp. But not as many people are looking at fiber. And that is, uh, you know, I, I, I grow CBDs too, you'll see these pictures of them, but. You know, CBDs and, and marijuana, they're awesome. But I'll tell you what, fiber is going to change the world. You know, the materials economy is what you've got to tackle. But also what I'm going to say is something you know, which is you don't want to tackle a materials economy that is, which is as wasteful as the materials economy we have now. There's no point of making a bunch of single-use hemp items when you need to re re remove single-use products from your materials economy. You know, those are the things that we need to look at. I don't want to be in the business of making a bunch of straws, right? You know, I don't want to be in the business of, of making things, what are those things called? Oh, Keurigs, right? You know what I'm talking about? Those little cups for coffee? Like, you see what I'm saying? is we need to be a little bit more mindful on what we produce. You know, not every plastic doll that comes out of China should be replaced with a hemp doll. Maybe we just need a little less stop. Okay, so this is our story. This is our crop from last year. This is um, some of my family. The ladies were asking about my, these are my son, the guy in the blue is my biological son. The guy, this is a nephew, then I got an adopted son. That's my partner, Don, he's the smartest guy, and this is Ron. One of my other partners who grows with me, this is on a tribal hemp field in northern Minnesota. The varieties that are grown here are European hemp varieties that were procured by the White Earth Tribe. And they were grown on a tribal hemp field. And I had the state hemp permit, and last year I took over their field. And then this year, this is a little later in the season, but this is this year's crop. The hemp is to the left. And uh, this is on Winona's Hemp and Heritage Farm, a farm that I purchased with the Kickstarter about two years ago so we could start to begin investigating the hemp economy. And um, what I want to say, so this is what it looks like when it's in the field and when it's initially getting cut. And then this is a little bit of my local architecture. This is 
hemp um, CBD varieties. These are the girls, I refer to them. These are all females. The, it's uh, males and females in the, in the hemp field itself. There's a lot of sex going on in that field that you just saw me. These are all girls, and um, I grow these at the hemp farm as well. I asked the USDA for a, for a greenhouse that they gave to the white farmers in my area. I asked for a high tunnel, and they didn't give me one, so I made a wigwam. It's much nicer, actually. It's kind of liberating. Um, so when the hemp economy was squashed in this country, we lost access to a lot of technology. And so when I began to work on figuring out what to do with our fiber hemp, I had to figure out uh, first how to grow it. It's gr it likes dry feet, and it uh, likes good nutrients. It will perennialize, the seeds will fall, but you need to grow, you need to put more nutrients in the soil. That's my advice to farmers. Plant them close together, and then they grow tall. And then I wanted to figure out, so you cut it and get it off your field, and then the next thing you need to do to, to separate the bast fiber from the herd is you need to do something called decorticating it. Decorticating. <laughs> and so, because we didn't have any in the United States, this is the historic photos that you have of the hemp decorticating. And this is, these are some of these, I don't know if this was the Winona hemp mills, but there was hemp mills in the town of Winona, Minnesota. And so, this is historic hemp decorticating equipment. So, my interest is, of course, in how you take, like, I have probably the same interest as a lot of you. What I want to do to determine is what is appropriate technology that can be scaled to the size to make canvas. You know, 10,000 lakes in Minnesota. If we just did the boats of the lakes in Minnesota, y'all follow me on this? You know what I'm saying is, is that that's a lot of decorticating and that's a lot of hemp. And you're not going to do it all by hand, and so you're going to need to mechanize it in some method. But so it's, it's like a puzzle, trying to reconstruct an industry that was made disappear, and a lot of the patents, a lot of the information was made disappear. And so I started like researching and trying to, you know, I would like research, and people would say, this person has a decorticator, or there's an open patent here, or this person, and so it's kind of like looking for a unicorn to find this mythical decorticator. And uh, so I followed many leads, I followed many leads, and most of them in, were not anything, except for one time I was at this hemp conference about two years ago, and it was in Colorado, NOCO, big hemp conference. And I went there, and it's kind of like going to, going to like hemp Disneyland or something. You know, and I'm saying that because I live in a really conservative area in northern Minnesota. And you know, I'm a cannabis farmer. I'm, I mean, now I just say I'm like, like a cannabis farmer. It's saying like, I am coming out as a cannabis farmer. That's what it's like because they'll say, oh, it's hemp. But then if you even said hemp in northern Minnesota, they would like back away from the room and say, you're all stoned, aren't you? I'd be like, no, I'm not stoned. You know, you'd have to smoke my entire field to get high. It's like less than 0.3%. There's nothing that you're going to get high on in my field, right? But it's like so demonized, you know, so demonized. And so I go to this conference and everything is made of hemp. There's like you know, hemp drinks, hemp beer, hemp-infused coffee, hemp clothes, hemp pasta noodles. It's just like hemp everywhere. Soap, body products. I was like, I felt like uh, what, it was, what it's like Alice in Wonderland. That's what it's like, because he went down the rabbit hole and all of a sudden you were in hemp world, you know? And I come out of this conference and there's this big machine there and uh, by Power Zone. And I'm looking at that machine looking at that machine, and, I, and I, uh, I say, lo and behold, that is a decorticator. <laughs> and then this white guy farmer comes up, like full on John Deere hat and everything, and he's like looking at that machine, and he said, I said, that's a decorticator. And he was like, oh. That was like first time in my life when I got to tell a white guy farmer what a piece of equipment was. <laughs> I was like, you put the bale in here, it rolls through here, it separates it out, there's the, it, you know, it's it was so great, it was such a great moment. Anyway, here's my decorticator. I got a decorticator from China. That's where you buy every piece of handy equipment in the world, apparently. Anyway, and uh, this is one of my nephews. Uh, this is uh, Neil LaDuc decorticating. He's very happy in his decorticating. And then um, this is 
this year's hemp crop. So that was last year's hemp crop. And so now what I'm trying to figure out is different decortication methods. And so I'm like putting this all out here for you to show, tell you everything I know, but I'm saying if people know about this, this is a super interesting thing that we need to work together on. Because if you're gonna change the world, you gotta work together, right? Okay, so the, the, this on the right, there's this really cool guy named Eric Nochi, whose wife is a Japanese weaver, and he produces hemp. Turns out hemp was banned in Japan after the war. Major industry banned, right? So this is what, this is artisan prepared hemp fiber from Minnesota varieties. So I went to interview this guy, super interesting guy. He takes it out of the field, and then, uh, and then this is our version of it on my wigwam in the wintertime. Nice, huh? The winter use of the wigwam. And then uh, this is what you do. You boil it. You, you like, um, what's that word? It's not poach. You blanch it. You blanch it. Something like that, or a little bit more. And then that sets it. And then after you set it like that, then you can go to the, to the this is pre-decorticated, and we're going to hand decorticate this so it's artisan. But this is what our hemp fiber looks like when we get it all decorticated and degummed. And so what I'm trying to figure out is we got it that far, but we need to figure out how to scale it. Because that's really interesting, and I might make a shirt by 2022. <laughs> right? <laughs> And that's not what we're doing here, right? All right. So we don't want to do, we, we're super interested in artisan, but we're more interested in it scaled, right? Artisan scaled. Now the questions that I am asking are the questions that you are asking at this conference. And those are questions of what is appropriate size? What is appropriate technology? How do you make sure that your carbon footprint is like non-existent, right? How do you do things well? How do you build a, rebuild a circular economy? Those are the questions that we all have to ask in every facet of work that we are involved in now. And so that is what I'm trying to ask here. It's like, my reservation is very windy. Could I build a, a, what scale of hemp mill can I build that will be able to be powered by renewable energy? That's my question. You know, I've got class four wind, I have solar. You know, maybe it only runs, you know, not all the, I don't know. Like those are the kind of questions I'm looking at. And then I could also just run it on hemp oil, <laughs> right? Because that's what Henry Ford did. And this is a little bit more about hemp building materials, you know, some of the other pieces um, of the industry, because if you've got that much hemp, 75% of it is uh, hemp herd, 25% is fiber. So 75% of my plant that I'm not using to make textiles is going to be um, available for some other products. This is historic hemp harvesting, kind of scaled up. I believe that this is um, in New Zealand. This is similar. You know, so I'm interested in the questions of at what scale you need how much energy and how you build an organic hemp textile industry in this country, how you rebuild an organic hemp textile industry in this country. This is all Henry Ford talking about his car he made out of hemp. You can make anything out of hemp. And in particularly, you know, in the, in the comparison, you know, with cotton, it's got three times the tensile strength of cotton and it doesn't require the agricultural chemicals. Similarly for trees, you know, similarly for forest products. So I believe that hemp is an essential to the next materials economy. And you could grow it all here. It needs to be North American. And then uh, just to say, because we want to make, so I'm, I'm just going to show you. These are hemp, my hemp pants. These are my hemp pants from China, right? The fabric is from China, all the fabric is from China. But so I wanna make this, which is short fiber, there's also long fiber. And long fiber is what you can make different things out of, but one of the things you make out of long fiber is rope. So I have some rope that my partner made me, which I didn't bring you tonight, but this is a rope making machine after scouring the world for a rope making machine, I found a rope making machine in which country? China. China, that's right. Exactly, and this is my Chinese team. 
There's a woman named Smiles that we talk to quite frequently when we want to know about equipment. She said, oh, here I am. And this is some, some uh, vintage milling equipment that in the idea of what I want to do, one day I would like to have, be able to turn my hemp fiber into a milled textile. And this is the equipment that I would feed the fiber that I have to figure out how to fully decorticate and degum into. Y'all follow me on this? So this is what they used to look like, the hemp mills of Minnesota. Pennsylvania also had a number of hemp mills. So it's like forensic research or forensic mystery trying to figure out how they did it because the industry has been illegal. And so, you know, we've looked in China, their scale is a lot larger, and I think that the chemical inputs are considered to be too harsh for anything I would consider appropriate. Then there's a question about the Eastern European milling industry, you know, because Romania and the Czech Republic still continue to mill some hemp, and then they mill some in Turkey. And then Canada is a country that has an immense amount of hemp, but they don't mill it into textiles. And I live, how I think, is I live just south of, of Winnipeg. I'm, I'm between Winnipeg and Minneapolis, and so I'm interested in building a regional hemp industry that is indigenous, owned, and organic in the Northern Plains territory where there are people like me and my tribe that have thousands of acres of land and could do well to produce such a diverse crop that could give you food, it could give you fuel, and it could give you textiles. So that combination to me seems to be the best for my region as we build the next economy. This is who I learned it from. This is, we call him the hamper. Alex White Plume, Lakota hemp farmer. His entire crop was seized by the DEA and uh, who arrested him and took his crop banned from growing hemp, but if you can see this picture, you can see I'm in it in his yard, which is entirely full of hemp. Because when the DEA seized his crop, they shook it on the way out. And so he lives in the middle of a hemp forest. <laughs> this is my village, you know, and I just show this because I live, you know, on the edge of my community and they have housing projects and we just started make, painting our housing projects. But the work that I'm describing, you know, is the work of this green path and is, a, is the work that where we light the eighth fire, the one that is beautiful, and we learn how to live together again, you know, in a beautiful way and have this moment. So I want to thank you very much for your time and the honor of being here with you and wish you the best for your conference. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Winona. Thanks for being our fire starter here.